Good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight. We are, as you know, wasting no time in kicking off our spring public lecture series here. And I mean that in more ways than one. Our guest speaker uh, it just flew in from the West Coast this afternoon to be with us. Um, and I want to say a quick thanks to um, Women uh, Leadership Network here at the school for thinking to invite Rosa, and uh, we're really happy that she's here. Um, so let me just say a few words to introduce her. Um, it's obviously my pleasure to introduce Rosa Shang. She is a respected architect with over 24 years of experience on really a variety of award-winning projects, including, among others, uh, some that you might recognize, the iconic Apple stores. Um, she recently joined, uh, a year ago, uh, Smith Group JJR uh, in San Francisco after a 20-year tenure with Bull and Sawinski Jackson, uh, also in San Francisco. She was a, a founding member of, of that firm's San Francisco office in, in 99. Um, her work really bears kind of a, a mark of aesthetic sophistication, but while also kind of engaging really robustly uh, issues of sustainability. But Rosa Sheng is also a really prominent, prominent thought leader. Um, she's been president of the San Francisco chapter of the AIA for four years now, and uh, through that, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, just this year. Um, and through that, w uh, was the founding chair of Equity by Design, um, which is a kind of national movement created by the AI San Francisco to advocate for equitable practices and pay in architecture. So Equity by Design, we'll hear about more, I'm sure, but um, uses data, among other things, to understand uh, what she calls pinch points or the factors kind of leading uh, or in the profession that contribute to uh, what's seen as a kind of a very precipitous drop, uh, especially in, among female architects between graduate school and practice. And we'll hear more about that tonight, I'm sure. Um, Rosa's led two uh, national equity in architecture surveys, which are uh, these far-reaching surveys uh, from which the data is called, authored an AIA national resolution, served on the equity for, uh, uh, sorry, served on the Equity and the Future of Architecture Committee for the past three years. She's presented her research and perspectives, um, many of which I'm sure we'll hear tonight, uh, in cities like Boston, New York, Lisbon, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and Seattle, and now Bristol. <laughs> um, her work has been featured in Architect Magazine, Architectural Record, Wall Street Journal, TEDx, Philadelphia, NPR, and the New York Times. And I'd say just, um, her lecture here at Roger Williams is, is really timely, as we're in the process of kind of a, as an institution of, of uh, raising awareness and engaging in discussions around equity and diversity, even with our own institution. So please join me in welcoming Rosa Shang. Thanks for that awesome intro. <laughs> so uh, forgive me if I seem a little tired I'm going to rev up here. I've been up since 2.30 a.m. West Coast time because I was just so anxious that I wouldn't miss that plane because if I missed the plane, I wasn't going to get here. So thank God everything worked out. Um, that being said, um, we're going to start off. I think this is a very good sized crowd to have a conversation. So this isn't as much a lecture as it is a discussion and a conversation. So there's going to be a lot of back and forth questions. First one is, um, the word equity and equality have been used interchangeably, and there's been a lot of confusion about the word, and there's no right or wrong answer, but how many people think that they have a good understanding of the difference between the two? If you do, raise your hand. Okay, that's usually the number of hands I get from the audience, and that's where we start the discussion. Um, where we start the framework before we get into any of the uh, survey findings or the background story is that equality traditionally means giving out the same resources regardless of the outcome, which is um, in this meme on the left side, you'll see equality with the boxes. So if you're thinking about this as a framework of uh, people looking over a fence to the World Series, what have you, a tall person doesn't need the box, but they get the box anyway in the equality framework. If you think about it in an equity framework, it's the idea of minimizing barriers to maximize potential for success. So in essence, different resources for different needs 
but maximizing the positive outcome. So in this case, everybody can see over the fence. The tall person realizes in this case, they don't need the box. In another situation, they might you know, be too tall to get something and the small person would help them, right? And then I've heard people say, well, what if you're always the tall person giving away your box? And the bigger kind of uh, reflection point is at some point in your life, you're going to be the short person. Chances are very likely, especially these days with all the natural disasters that are happening, unexpected consequences in your lifetime, you might be the, short, you know, the small person. So rather than having a mindset of uh, me first, it's this mindset of we first. If we have each other's backs, if we can work together to get to the problem solving of what the challenges are within practice in the future of architecture, we can get there faster and we could make a better sustainable practice for us all. So the question starts with why equity matters, then why does architecture matter? I think that's kind of a little bit rhetorical within our uh, student and uh, practice discourse, but it's healthy to talk about it. So when I grew up, I grew up in suburbia, and all I knew were uh, malls and uh, track homes as architecture. That was my framework for architecture. And it wasn't until I went to go visit my um, grandparents in, I'm gonna fast forward for a second, um, in China that I had this idea, wow, that wasn't architecture at all. It was actually these significant buildings and my grandfather said, you know, it isn't just, architecture isn't just for a, a person's lifetime, it goes beyond the lifetime of that person. It's actually to capture civilization, the culture. It's a time capsule, right? It's more, it's meant more as this um, physical manifestation of profound impact on a given society at any given time in perpetuity. So that was like a wow moment, right? All in Chinese, of course, and I'm trying to understand him as he's uh, spewing off these things. So how I wanted to become an architect at the ripe old age of 11, right? That's when I went to China and I had this amazing time. I went to go see the Forbidden City and the Great Wall, and that was architecture to me, and I wanted to have profound impact as well. And then, so I'm gonna go back to this slide, which is, you know, 20 years later, after I went through training and architecture school and all that, I got to a point where I wanted to quit architecture. I wanted to leave the profession. So from the point that I wanted to become an architect to the point I wanted to leave, the question goes, why, right? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. But also, that's not my story only. That is the story of many in our profession. So, I love Lucy. How many people know this video of just keeping up? How many people feel like they're just keeping up? They're keeping appearances, right? You're hiding. You're really not keeping up, but you're pretending you are. Well, at some point, it's gonna all catch up with us if we keep pretending. So we have to start talking about these problems more openly because we, you know, we want to look strong, we want to look invincible, but unless we uncover these challenges and have an open dialogue, we're never going to solve, you know, what's really hurting us, or what's preventing us from succeeding. So fast forward, love architecture, went to architecture school, went to Syracuse University, studied um, mainly uh, Eurocentric architecture, didn't really study Asian architecture until my thesis project, when I started questioning why were we just learning about a very monoculture architecture, if you will. And at that point, I decided you know, that I was going to be this great architect and I was going to change the world. You know, still very um, optimistic at that point. Graduated during a recession, and um, my first job out of school was actually drafting bathrooms and designing malls in America. Back to the malls, right? How did I go so far away and then come back to the place where I started? And again, a question whether or not I should um, leave the practice of architecture. But a friend of mine called me up she worked in the Pittsburgh office of Bolin Swinsky Jackson, and she said, hey, why don't you come out uh, to Pittsburgh and interview for a job? We're working on this great project for this company called Pixar Animation Studios, and at that point, nobody knew what Pixar did because Pixar was a brand new company. Uh, the digital animation age, right, was at its nascent point. So I said, sure, that sounds like fun, something new, something different, went out to Pittsburgh. Then we started flying back and forth to California, and an interesting thing happened. Um, we were out there, the client had us out for dinner, and then they told us, you know, it looks like we're not going to finish on time with the schedule. Is there anything we could do to change how we're working, make the project go faster, finish on time, and have a great product? And I had a couple of drinks, and I 
lost my inhibition and I said, well, you can move the entire team out to California. And everybody laughed at me. But lo and behold, three months later, the entire team was out in California. We ended up establishing the San Francisco office for Bolenswinski Jackson out of that project. And it was a lesson learned in not being afraid to say the stupid answer or ask the stupid question, right? Why not? You know, why are we doing things the way we're doing? Can't we do better? Um, fast forward again. So after the Pixar Animation Studios project, I had the pleasure of working with Steve Jobs as he was coming back into Apple. At that point, he, was, had, he had this crazy idea of st having all uh, computers, uh, all his stores, which there were none of at that time, selling Apple computers and Apple products. At that point, they're sold through third party. Everybody laughed and said, there's no way you're going to be able to have an entire stores that sell Apple computers. There's only 2% market share, right? But he had this vision, reality distortion field, and he asked us to believe, suspend disbelief so that we could actually build these stores. He wanted all glass staircases, no structural steel. Again, never been done before, did not exist. And he challenged us to the point where the team that worked on the project with the structural engineers, with the glass fabricators from Germany, because nobody in the US wanted to touch it, fittings manufacturer in Boston, tri-pyramid structures. It was this think tank. We are in this reality distortion field, and we got there. Now ubiquitous glass structures you know, of staircases, skylights, what have you, amazing you know, large pieces of glass that you would never think of before, because he challenged us. So that's a lesson learned, right? Suspend disbelief when you think nothing can be done to solve a problem. So the last story I'm going to tell of this kind of positive trajectory before things start getting a little weird is that the um, last story I worked on was the Apple Cube in New York City before I um, sort of retired from the retail stores. I um, got married, as you saw in the last photo, and uh, was pregnant with my first child when this project was being designed. I was flying back and forth. And then as the project was being completed, I had my first child, and I thought, that's it. I'm done with Apple. Um, Steve had been a very good champion for me at the time, and he asked, well, why don't you come and have dinner with us and the team, but I only have one spot for you, and I don't have any spots for your family. Can you come alone? And I said I couldn't because I was nursing at the time. I couldn't tell him that. Um, so I declined, and I thought, stupid, chance of a lifetime. Who turns down dinner with Steve Jobs? Of course, he came back again thinking that, that was a little crazy for me to say no, right? So he said, OK, you could bring your husband, but you need to get a babysitter. No kids coming tonight. Can you get a babysitter? And again, I graciously declined. I wasn't going to leave my kid behind, nine month old. And then at the end of the day, an amazing thing happened. So the whole store is crowded. It's the first day it's open. Parting of the Red Sea, Steve comes walking over, and he says this, OK, the kid can come, but she poops, she pees, she cries, she's out. Wow, what an invitation, right? <laughs> so here's the photo um, this photographer took at the moment that he's asking me with the daggers in his eyes going, ah. And then Katie Cotton, his publicist, is biting her fingernails like, just say yes. I've been trying to change the reservation three times already today. I said yes. A daughter came, was on her best behavior, thank God. And at the end, he said, you know, your daughter's really great. She could come to dinner with us anytime. But the lesson learned there was that somebody believed in me to have me at the table, not just that night, but before that. He would always ask for my opinion at the design table. And it showed me and it reminds me that we all need champions um, in our work, in our professional development, in our life's goals. We can't do it alone. We reach points and stumbling blocks, and we need people to be our champions. And not only do we need that, we need also to be champions to other people. We need to pay it forward. Because those people that are struggling with whatever difficulties there are, we say, oh, we just bootstrap it because we did it that way. Well, we didn't really do it that way. We had champions help us. So remind yourselves of who your champions are. And then as you go forward in your careers, become that champion to somebody else. Fast forward, OK, 2009. Who remembers 2009? Probably it was. Not so relevant for students, but for professionals, it was a bad, bad time, recession. At that time, um, I was finishing up a project which was an amazing experience for a women's college in Oakland. It was meant to, it raised awareness about the fact that there are less than 3% uh, 
CEOs, women leaders in business. And their mission was to build the business schools from startup uh, where they would train women to be seasoned business professionals. And they were committed to this idea. They got a donor, a Lori I. Loki, who was um, the head of Business Wire. He believed in that mission and he invested $20 million in this building. So they were seeking architects and they asked us to come and interview. And they picked us because we had a team of not just uh, diversity, but women in leadership positions. So women in the structural um, engineering role, mechanical engineering, even the superintendent for the construction company was a woman. So we had a blended team, men and women, but we were making sure that what we heard from them was that they wanted to walk the talk. They weren't only going to build this business school for women, they wanted the building to be built by women as well. So it was an amazing experience. And Nancy Thornborough, she passed away last year, but she, again, was a champion. She had this committed belief, and by hook or by crook, she was going to get there. And she built the school literally from nothing uh, with 10 students. Uh, less, it was about 10 years ago, the anniversary. And today, there's like 150 students who are um, committed to social responsibility. That's also um, a theme of the, the building, which, again, is a starting point for me realizing that architecture can affect people in many ways that we don't communicate very well. We know it as architects, but the people that are experiencing it don't know it unless we communicate that to them. And as you can see here, there's a diverse body of students who go there now, not just women, but um, people of color, those that are underrepresented in business today. So they're really committed to that mission. Okay, fast forward, the recession. Um, I had my second child at the beginning of the recession, and as I came back, there were a lot of layoffs, and it's, I was very depressed about my career tra trajectory because it wasn't going to be anything close to what it had been in that first half that we had talked about. So this quote from Lynn manuel Miranda sticks out to me as this motivational moment in that we all grapple with the paradox that tomorrow is not promised, but we make plans anyway. So we can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow, we can't predict uh, the fact that somebody is saying that the jobs that we have today will not no longer exist tomorrow. You know, in five years, we're going to have completely different jobs. A lot of people are still in disbelief about that and fear about that. Um, but we should embrace that. We should make plans to kind of envision the future together of what architecture will be in this new world that's evolving with technology advancing so quickly, and we need to keep up as well. So at that nascent point of me debating about whether or not I was going to leave architecture, there's a lot of things happening. Um, tangentially, there was uh, Architect Barbie came out of nowhere. Why Architect Barbie and who cares, right? Uh, but it, was a, it started that debate about why it was Im important um, to have the discussion about women as architects or the lack thereof women in architecture. There was the Pritzker Prize controversy with uh, the, um, the two petitioners from Harvard GSD, Women in Architecture, who were lobbying for Denise Scott Brown to be recognized with Robert Venturi. Um, they weren't successful, but they were successful in bringing the issue to a larger discussion in mass. And then Lean In was published. So there was a lot going on. And we, I, at that point, I went to a symposium. I participated in as a panelist. And at that point, people said, we need to do something. So we said, yes, let's do something. It was called the missing 32%. Some of you may have heard that statistic before, where in architecture school, you graduate men and women nearly 50-50. But by the time um, women get to licensed professionals or owners, they're less than um, 18 to 12% in the industry. And that still holds true, even though we're improving slightly. So we committed to um, starting this committee in AIA San Francisco called the missing 32%. And it became equity by design. And at that point, uh, we were all gung-ho that we're going to do something amazing. We were looking for research, and there was none out there to kind of navigate us of what problems we were trying to solve. So we said, well, if there's no research. We're just going to do a research project. We had never done a research project before, and I felt like I'd committed to eating a whale. I don't know if anybody has heard this poem from Shel Silverstein about a little girl who claims she's going to eat this big, giant whale. And everybody laughs at her because they say, of course, you can't do it because you're this tiny little girl and there's a big fat whale. So at the same time, I felt chagrined about claiming we were going to eat this whale and doing this survey that we had never done before. 
I also realized that we couldn't get there alone, that we needed partners, we needed people to come to the table with us to grab a fork and to eat that whale with us. So if we all collectively were to solve the problem together, which we see today, we're finally getting that critical mass. We're, we're doing our third survey. We're hoping to reach 10,000 people. We have buy-in from a lot of the AIA chapters, but also universities interested in the research. So we're getting to be these multiple fork holders of eating that whale. We need to um, also acknowledge that at this pivotal point, um, there was an article written by Alexander Lang, Architecture's Lean In Moment, talking about the challenges we have in architecture and not being recognized for our work, um, the eroding kind of services that we provide, the fact that the community does not understand very well what architects do, and that related to this kind of challenge situation of, of my whole uh, disconnect, disenfranchisement with what I thought architecture was going to be. So she said, we need to create a new set of best practices that will be a design project in and of itself, and then based on research and examples and interpretation, and then getting partners, we are going to solve the problem together. So that was the aha moment of we needed to do research. So in 2014, we launched the first survey. We had a group in the committee that talked about um, what were the challenges in discussion, but what were those things in the course of your life as an architect from when you graduated to when you retired that could cause you to leave. We started with this linear approach, which talked about pinch points. So uh, from graduation, you know, finding the right fit, getting the right job. If you graduated during a recession, you know, people questioned, well, why did you get a job in something else and then come back into architecture? You know, that kind of framed whether or not you would be successful if you graduated during a boom period or a recession. And a lot of people left during that 2009 recession that we're never going to get back. And then there's um, paying your dues, which is the idea that, again, we suffered through this long um, apprenticeship, if you will, internship. Everybody else has to suffer with us, right? We're, we're gonna make you draw bathroom details until, you know, the end of time until you're ready, and then you're gonna take your licensing exam, right? And there was this long, arduous process of taking the exam, and it's still a challenging, but NCARB at least has acknowledged that, and they've, in the last five years, made amazing strides to um, address that pinch point, which we brought out in 2014. They've got the AXP program, they have got a lot of digital resources. So we have seen a lot of positive things coming out of this awareness of what the challenges are. The fourth pinch point is working parents, which has turned into caregiving because while we started focusing on mothers and fathers, we realized that caregiving expands beyond that to self-care, caring for parents, elderly, loved ones, your spouse, et cetera. So it's not just caring for children. And then finally, the glass ceiling, which talks about implicit bias issues, not just for women or people of color, but it could be um, anything from um, the fact that you have a physical disability or a mental disability, et cetera, et cetera. What are the biases that are preventing people from getting the opportunities to succeed? So fast forward 2016, uh, we expanded the survey and its reach into this concept of career dynamics. So career dynamics is another layer of challenges, if you will, but they don't happen in this linear progression they actually could happen to you at multiple times during your career. Um, they could happen at the beginning or the end. They could happen continuously for some people, unfortunately. So those topics are finding the right fit, um, work-life integration, um, sorry, professional development uh, beyond architecture, and finally pay equity. Those are things that could happen throughout your, the course of your career. So in 2016, we had 8,664 respondents. I'm going to focus on that survey finding data. The 2014 is available on our website as a report. We're on the cusp of publishing the 2016 report in the next couple of weeks. And then we're also launching the 2018 survey at the beginning of February. So a lot happening, but a lot of this information will help you wrap your head around what it is that we're trying to study and get at. So we had approximately 50-50 men and women take the study. We did ask the question about gender identity. We didn't get that many people answering uh, whether they're of a, another gender identity. So we only had six people, and therefore we couldn't do any study. We're hoping to get more people in 2018 that answer that so we could do a little bit of analysis there. Um, 
we also had, with race and ethnicity as a new topic area, we didn't have that in 2014, uh, but we thought that was important in studying the challenges and barriers that architects could face in their career lifetime. Uh, sadly, we only had, uh, we had an accurate representation of who is in architecture, so you could see a lot, the majority of people are uh, in practicing architecture are white, and then non-white is an accurate representation of who is in the field. Again, we're trying to get more outreach to NOMA and other organizations representing um, different race and ethnicities. So the other thing that was interesting is we had more younger responders who are women and older responders who are male. Some of that is trending with uh, who is coming into architecture, but that is also a, a course correction in how we had distributed the survey to our survey partners. Some of them, such as NCARB, had 4,000 people respond and they are licensed, they're record holders or they're um, AXP, so they're younger as a population. And again, self-selection bias, we tried to control for that, but more women were interested in the survey than men at that point. We're again, trying to balance it out because we're trying to reframe the fact that this is for everyone. This survey is uncovering the challenges that everyone faces, not just women. Um, and in that comparison, we course correct by showing by years of experience, knowing that we have more women in the younger, cate younger categories of experience answering than the elder. So st the f starting first off, the top reasons for leaving your last job. The biggest reason people said was better opportunities, but um, you could see that not uh, far from that follows uh, no promotion, um, low pay, lack of opportunities for advancement or meaningful work. <clears throat> in the, um, the next category of predictors of firm culture and, and success and retention, we found that people who thought that their values were represented and aligned with the firms that they worked at, people who thought they had a seat at the table, and people who felt that their work was meaningful, their day-to-day -day work was meaningful to their long-term career goals, were more likely to stay at their jobs than people who had no preparation for professional development and also no friendships. That's something that's going to come up again and again, which we found surprising that it had such a strong influence on retention, but it actually does. So another question that we asked is, do you ask for um, guidance? And if you do, um, in your day-to-day -day practice, who do you ask? So as far as senior leadership in my firm, more men ask than women, slightly. And then um, non-leaders, someone else, so peers, um, friends, et cetera, women slightly more than men tended to ask their peers and friends and family. And then um, from that information, the impact though was pretty amazing. So those that did receive senior guidance, uh, guidance from senior leaders and their positive impact, you could see on each of these trajectories, whether it was better retention probability, whether it was um, more um, energized by their work, whether it was work-life flexibility or focus, women tended to have more, even though that they were slightly less likely to ask for senior guidance when they did have a good relationship to ask for senior guidance, they were more likely to stay in, and had positive attitudes overall. So that shows us uh, something that we're trying to talk to firms about, which is, do you have a mentorship program? Do you have access to senior leaders? There's actually two groups who are focusing on that right now, one in Boston and one in DC, uh, called Girl Uninterrupted. So it's kind of a play on words, but it is focused on this particular finding that we brought up. The next one is uh, metrics of success and this spectrum of burnout and engagement, which is a corollary to business school findings about burnout and engagement. So on that spectrum, there is all these different questions that we asked the respondents from autonomy, satisfaction, um, whether or not, again, meaningful work, whether or not they've had a seat at the table, et cetera. And we found that, um, again, more, more men uh, were answering in the first range and were thus more engaged. But this was kind of an interesting spectrum in the next series of findings that you'll see. So those that answered that they were more likely to be engaged in their work, they believed that their day-to-day -day career goals, men and women, um, were relevant, again, to their long-term goals. And then um, the other thing was that they had feedback from ongoing feedback. So not just annual reviews, but uh, monthly or quarterly reviews 
constantly from those senior leaders. So those were the people that were more likely to stay. Those that were less likely to stay and more likely to burn out um, didn't know the p performance evaluation criteria in their firm, which was really important. Um, you know, the promotion processes and how you get ahead, it was usually un, um, it was informal and it wasn't written down. And then also that they didn't know, uh, they didn't have any friendships at work. That was another factor of burnout, which again, seems really kind of intuitive. Like, of course you would have friends, but a lot of people have professional relationships, but they don't have strong friendships, people to turn to when they have that challenge. In terms of salary and pay equity, we do see that there is a pay gap starting from when um, architecture uh, students graduate all through the career, but the chasm widens as it goes forward. So from zero years of experience, it is a $3,000 difference between men and women, um, debunking the theory that, well, it's because you know, women work less because they you know, take time off to have kids or whatever it is. Um, there is some bias in there that we haven't figured out yet, uh, but we're going to get to the, dig deeper in that in the next survey. Uh, we did cross-analyze um, average salary by licensure status as well, and there is a positive benefit to being licensed. The people that were licensed did make more than their unlicensed counterparts. Uh, this is cross-analyzed uh, by race and ethnicity and gender, so this actually correlates to a lot of information that's out there in business school, which is that white males make more than their um, counterparts, and then it tears down, so people of color, male, uh, men of color, and then uh, white women, and then women of color in that range. What that correlates to is uh, a, a research finding about racial bias um, not only in resumes, but in promotion processes. So how do we address those biases? How do we raise bias awareness? Uh, Harvard has this uh, implicit bias um, center, and they do uh, these quizzes and workshops that help to uncover that. And I think that's something that we've done workshops on, and I think that's something I highly recommend that you try to integrate in your curriculum, if at all possible, because I think that starts not only to shape uh, workplace attitudes, but also attitudes towards our future clients and who we work with. Also, the interesting thing for pay equity is an analysis across roles in firms. So from principal in charge, design principals, uh, et cetera, project managers, I highlight with an arrow design principles because that is the biggest gap, as you could see, at uh, approximately thirty to $40,000 difference between the two roles uh, or between the two genders. And that correlates to a creativity bias study done by Duke University Fuqua School of Business, where they actually simulated an architect's portfolio. They did five studies. The first one was, happened to be architects. Um, architecture portfolio, they gave one group the name as a male, the other group female. Same exact portfolio, same exact resume. And both men and women rated the male uh, portfolio to be more creative than the female portfolio. They did the same for fashion design, but there wasn't that gap. It was more equal. So this uh, image is a Google search of um, architect. If you type in architect, this is what you get. So the biases are being reinforced not only in society, through media, through the internet, but by ourselves as well. So how do we have that course correct for that discussion about uh, making sure that we acknowledge who the creatives are, getting more women in design roles, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can combat for that creativity bias. Average salaries by caregiving status is also interesting in that it correlates to a Harvard study uh, dubbed uh, that fathers make more than mothers, right? So in our study, it correlates similarly where uh, male parents make more than their non-parent counterparts, but female parents make the least. And again, that brings into question the biases we have of who is supposed to be the primary caregiver and who is supposed to be the primary breadwinner traditionally. Um, when compared, uh, this was an interesting question about negotiation. So when we asked if uh, they're satisfied with their salaries and if they weren't, did they negotiate for a higher salary? And time and time again, men and women, less than 40% uh, negotiated, less than 35% actually, negotiated for a better condition. So that tells us something about 
um, how we're trained uh, and the perceptions we have about negotiation being taboo, right? Asking for money. So uh, we started doing negotiation workshops in kind of debunking those theories of, because we negotiate for our design, we're very strong in our opinion about what we believe about design, but when it turns into money, all of a sudden we you know, get a little antsy and awkward about asking for more money, and that's something that if we don't ask for more money in our fees and services and lobby for our clients in change orders in the construction field, then we lose our value and we can't pay, we can't afford to pay the salaries we need to pay to keep architects in the profession. So it's all tied together in this whole system. How do we change that? Um, salary, negotiating salary by number of years experience, you could see um, this is just a more finite kind of division of um, who gets paid more. Uh, uh, assuming that the sad thing is that the females that did negotiate still made the same or a little less than the male non-negotiators at critical points in the career. That was the takeaway from this particular slide. So how do we, again, change those perceptions about women negotiating versus men negotiating as a bias? Uh, likelihood of being a principal. In this case, the interesting aha moment is that non-white males are less likely, least likely to be principals than their other counterparts in the profession. Um, again, we need to do a deeper dive study into that cause, and we're gonna ask the same question again and see if we get the same answer in 2018 and figure out if we can figure out why. Um, gender balance among leadership in firms. The perception is that most firms are mostly male. In this survey response, it, it was uh, validated. So how do we change that? And in, uh, luckily in Smith Group, they're acknowledging that that is the case and they're trying to promote, promote more female leaders um, into leadership and doing a um, more uh, equitable system of promotion so rather than having just principals promote other principals, there's a kind of nomination system among peers, among people you work with. So opening up that nomination systems helps bring more candidates to the table as, an, as a way to solve the problem. Um, most of the leaders are in, um, principals are in, in smaller firms, and that's true of the industry, but you could see that there's more male principals in larger firms than female principals. And then um, early versus late career perception. So this is something that you should be interested in, in the things that uh, the early career um, respondents answered was that they had more positive outlook about their workload and their overall career optimism and their work-life balance, but they are feeling very negatively about meaningful work, um, their sense of involvement, the seat at the table, whether or not um, their projects energize them and whether or not they're likely to stay at their current job. And again, the top correlations between early likelihood of retention versus leaving, those that were more likely to stay, again, had access to senior leadership, one-on-one -on -one coaching, that was really important, and the performance evaluation criteria, knowing exactly what to expect and how to get to the next part of your career and being mentored to do so. Those that felt like they were ready to leave, um, they had no performance evaluation um, processes, they didn't have any um, friends at work, and there was no preparation for additional roles, and also they didn't know what the process was. So even if a firm had a promotion process, they didn't know what it was. So that was even worse than not having a process, which is really weird. <laughs> um, the value of licensure, again, a lot of people question whether or not licensure is valid or whether or not you need it, because you work at a larger firm, somebody else stamps the drawings, why do I need a license? It's a lot of challenge to go through the process and get there. What is it worth, right? Trying to figure that out. A lot of people, the top reasons people got licensed in our survey, it was the ability to call themselves an architect, uh, the ability to practice independently if they chose to start their own practice, and then a heightened sense of professional standards. Um, again, as you could see, uh, for licensure, the, the biggest challenges were long hours, uh, the high cost of licensure, lack of rewards, and um, the difficulty of the REs and other life challenges, right? So the lesson learned here was as soon as, you're, as soon as you graduate, as early as you can, or even with the new program where you start taking the exams in school where they start offering that, there's certain um, universities that have collaborated with NCARB to offer exams during the time that you're in school to cut down on that 
what if time because the later it gets in life happens, the more challenges come up and the less likely you are to get licensed. But we have found the, that there are corollaries between the importance of licensure and career success in our respondents. Oh, this is an interesting one. So we're gonna shift to work life. Um, we asked the question, I have, do you have time to pursue um, your interests outside of work? And it was kind of interesting to see those that thought that they did believed that, again, their day-to-day -day work had a relevance to their career goals and that they saw that their firm leaders were actually taking the time off, that they were walking the talk. That, that it wasn't just a policy, you have work-life flex, but they're doing it too, so they could model it. And then um, those that said they didn't have enough time to do their work didn't know uh, what the performance evaluation criteria was in their firm, so they were kind of afraid to you know, take time off. Um, they worked more than 44 hours a week, and again, there was no work-life flex policies in place to help them manage that time off. Uh, when asked what, if you had a challenge with work-life flexibility, where did you take the hit? Uh, on your professional side or your, on your personal side? And as you can see here, overwhelmingly, most people took the hit on the personal side of their lives rather than taking it on the professional side, whether it was health or personal relationships, what have you. Um, whether And then the interesting shift for childcare, as you could see, is um, again, back to that idea of primary caregiver. More women of our respondents answered that they were the primary caregiver versus the men. And even to you know the, the newborn birth of a child, the difference between one and three days of, of the male respondents versus the three months of the women responding. And how that correlates, again, back to the salaries of caregivers, right? So there's all these structural things happening and challenges. How do we create policies that are equitable to support families and to support mothers coming back to work, whether it's uh, the, you know, the lactation room or whether it's a ramping on or ramping off process that allows flexible work to happen, whether it's technology that allows computers to go home and to be able to log into the server. So we're brainstorming all these things at Smith Group, but also there's other firms doing that as well. So Perkins and Will, these larger firms are trying to pave the way to solve these challenges that we're highlighting. So a lot of information. I only gave you kind of the tasting menu. The full video of all the findings, because you'd fall asleep right now, uh, is online and at our website, EQX design.com and again it has um, I'd say 75% of the findings the full findings book will come out in the next uh, two to three weeks and they do the deep dive into the pay equity we talk about temporal flexibility the perception of butts in seats that you're only as valuable as uh, the time that somebody can physically see you in the office versus the value that you could create by being out there hitting the pavement making new client relationships um, coming up with new ways to practice architecture. So how do we shift the value system of, I see you, you're valuable, I don't see you, you're not valuable, right? Big questions. Uh, we're gonna shift the discussion to why equity matters beyond architecture. So we heard from the um, census report, the US census report, that by 2045, the majority population in the US will be actually uh, underrepresent, today's underrepresented um, race and ethnicities. So I have this diagram kind of representing that idea. That scares a lot of people. We're seeing that kind of play itself out now today in our politics, uh, the immigration debate, um, who has uh, the right to education, who has the right to opportunities and resources, that's coming to a head right now. Whereas two years before, nobody believed that uh, we are dealing with ra we we're still dealing with racism, that we're still dealing with sex sexism. You know, those were kind of, what do you mean those things are gone? And now all of a sudden it's this scary realization that those things aren't gone and that we have to be even more present in these discussions. So how does that affect architecture? It affects the places that we live and the resources that we have access to, whether it's schools, whether it's housing, whether it's um, the distance that you drive from your job where you can, and, and the house where you can afford to live, that distance is becoming a longer and longer commute for many people who can't afford to live, ironically, in the cities that they work in. Uh, so the, there's an amazing resource called the Equity Atlas that talks about the power and the potential of if we could, again, minimize barriers to maximize the potential for success, we would create 
this economic prosperity groundswell. So more people being prosperous would create a stronger economy and therefore feed back into it. Um, health and life expectancy. So this was really startling to me, realizing that the zip code that you live in could affect the you know, number of years that you're expected to live. And again, because certain people couldn't afford to live in a certain area or other people had to live in an area where there was more toxins, between like five, I think nine years difference, if you could see, and it's not even like a 10 mile difference in New Orleans. And then even between the different uh, race and ethnicities, there was a study done that was on Mother Jones about the nitrogen uh, dioxide pollution in our, in our uh, air, right? And again, where we live. Uh, why equity matters for basic human needs. This has been a debate, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, the all gender restrooms, whether it's a law, whether it's uh, we can't do anything because the code tells us we can't. Uh, we see this as an opportunity for architects to be problem solvers in designing bathrooms that aren't based on gender, but are based on size or resource or need. There's this woman named Esper Sperber in New York who did a video about bathrooms by size. So how do we create different uh, sizes of bathrooms to address not just transgender folks, but also um, caregivers for those of the opposite gender, um, those parents with multiple gendered kids, right? So all different people need different things. How do we address that with, that's a design problem that we as architects can solve and be the leaders of. Uh, where is the, and then why equity matters for mothers and families, where's the, support and uh, dignity for what we expect of mothers. If you know, we're to continue with our population growth, we have to continue with our population growth because that supports the economy. However, we don't support mothers and families. We shame them when they are publicly breastfeeding. We don't provide resources for them when they're coming back to work uh, to be able to, to support their families. And there's this kind of divide, even with those that are seniors, um, there's not a lot of safety resources for them in public areas. So at night, we're, we expect those that are you know, young or old or frail or weak to be home and not in the streets you know, because it's not safe. Why is that? When in certain other cultures, it's safe to be out at night in the public square because everybody's out there and that's part of the culture, right? What, how can we learn from that? Finally, a really fascinating thing is about why equity matters for humanity. Um, designing Justice and, and Designing Spaces is a project by Deanna Van Buren, an architect out of Oakland, California, who is challenging the justice system and uh, restorative justice and whether or not uh, prisoners can be rehabilitated using design to improve their current spaces, but also give them a way to communicate um, their creativity, but also um, their, their ideas about what how space can positively influence them in becoming uh, better citizens once they leave. So she's doing amazing work there with workshops, helping them communicate uh, with these collages, et cetera, about dignified spaces. Uh, because the amazing thing also is that uh, there was this TED talk uh, from a former prisoner saying that the most violent things in prison wasn't the other prisoners, wasn't the, the uh, officers, it was the walls, right? So mental health, lack of access to air. You know, we talk about this all the time in architecture that we need air, light, views, biophilic design, that that's inherent in who we are as humans and we deny that to prisoners. Just because, yes, they did something wrong, but there's an inhumanity in the spaces that they're expected to live in, right? While they're supposed to be rehabilitated. Uh, finally, teaching the next generation. So hip hop architecture is a thing. Um, there is a, a gentleman professor by the name of Michael Ford who has written a book about the history of urban development and its effects on um, underrepresented populations, namely African Americans. Uh, he talks about Chicago, he talks about Le Corbusier and the kind of fail failings of the projects, if you will, and the listening of the lyrics in hip hop architecture talk about those inhumane conditions and where they live and the outcomes of that, the violence. So as kind of a twist on that, he's trying to use hip hop, which is the language, the vernacular of the students and their communities and leveraging that to turn it into a positive thing about 
them becoming designers or the creators of their own environment? How do you switch this kind of disinterest in architecture because it hurts them into something that motivates them and helps them solve their own problems? And he's been on the Today Show. He's done a TEDx talk. So highly recommend if you can get him to come here. Is very inspiring. And he's done a, a bunch of um, camps this summer with Autodesk, and he's continuing into the next season in 2018. Uh, so a lot of information. Um, our group, Equity by Design, hosts a symposium every year. Uh, this year it will be in um, San Francisco, November 3rd. What, knowing this information is half the battle, but getting everybody together to talk about and, and again, problem solve, eating that whale is the other half. So we do workshops. We connect with people across the industry, not just women, but men as well. Um, we come up with strategies where we ask people to commit to whatever their passion is, what one little bite of the whale they're going to take, and commit to that for the year. And again, it's it kind of exploded into what people are willing to do within their firms, uh, within their communities as citizen architects, et cetera. And then this was one of the kind of uh, 3D uh, fruitions of those commitments kind of stacked together in this uh, Eames House of Cards that was also architectural and part of the design creativity of the group. Uh, hackathon is something that we've been doing um, for the last four years. How many people know what a hackathon is? Great, awesome. So we've taken the Silicon Valley model of design thinking and we've turned it on its head to solve these challenges we have in architectural practice. We do a four hour workshop at the AI conference. We're going to do it again in New York City. Um, this, so I'll send out the information if anybody's interested. It's actually free this year. Uh, they used to charge for it, but we were able to negotiate it to be free so that students could go and young professionals. And that's the key to the success is we have a diverse group of people that go. It's a way to get strangers together to solve these problems. They come up with a business pitch. Um, they pitch to venture capitalists. and. Uh, we haven't gone to the next step, which is actually funding the winning idea, but we're trying to get there. So each year it gets better and better. And uh, each alumni class that attends writes blog posts about what they learned. So we have that on our website if anybody's interested in the learnings of the hackathons. So finally, there's a couple of uh, recommendations, like wh what can we do to be change agents for these challenges we have? One is to support the research, not only to read the research, but to share it, talk about it share the findings, figure out how you, when you get into practice, measure up to it. Um, if it's not working, make changes and measure again, and then reassess and repeat. As far as the meaning in our careers, how do we get that, how do we maintain that? Making connections, um, those friendships that were so vital to engagement. Uh, make a con concerted effort to not just to be friends with the people that you nat naturally gravitate towards, but people who are completely unlike you in diversity of background, of ethnicity, of socioeconomic class. Because that's where we get the richest uh, connections, if you will. People who we'd never be friends with become our best friends. And uh, our lives are so much better because of it. Embrace technology. I know a lot of you are digital natives, so I don't have to worry about you. But I tell this to the practitioners, because they're deathly afraid of technology and Twitter. But that's actually where we're making a groundswell of movement and Facebook and LinkedIn and connecting all the architects to talk about all these challenges together and again, brainstorm and create new initiatives. Uh, the, the mentorship is so important as we've seen with the senior guidance and the influence and the positive influence. Seek a mentor, be a mentor and cultivate mentorship, not only now, but in your, through the, out the lifetime of your career. Um, engage with communities. This is something that's really important that we take for granted. We are part of a community, but we don't, share the architecture part with our communities. And I'm trying to do that more. So I volunteered for um, my daughters, uh, the, the Board of Ed. They're building a bunch of new projects for their school system. So I volunteered to be a peer reviewer to help them set standards and interview the people that come in and want to be architects or contractors for these projects. Because that's important. Because otherwise, there would be no design. I There's a group of parents that are architects, engineers, et cetera, that believe so much that we we need better schools, but we can't get better schools unless we're involved in the process. So whatever you feel passionate about in your community, I know work takes up a lot of time, but that critical part is also how you create value and people, you get projects that way eventually, is by having those community connections and even serving in uh, 
you know, running for office. That's something that's a big theme right now, whether it's small and it's the Board of Ed, whether it's the council, town council, start small, right? Get involved in that lower dimension and then build your way up. Finally, um, matrices. Again, connecting with people all over the world through Twitter, but um, their strength in numbers. And um, if we're all committed, as we saw last week with the Women's March, and if you saw the New York Times article and they had photos from all over the world, they had Antarctica, they had uh, Europe, they had Asia. It was amazing to see the number of people who came out to, with a belief of trying to improve our values and improving our world together. So I think we're in this groundswell movement right now that we can kind of catch the wave and re make positive change. Finally, um, this is again just a look ahead at what's coming up in 2012. We have the survey. Um, next month we have uh, a lot of conference activities and workshops. And we're again trying to do scholarships and make as many of those events affordable to students and young architects. And then finally, our symposium, which will be the big reveal at the end of the year with the survey findings, hopefully 10,000 plus from 2018. So eat the whale, big fork. There's a divide in the road. You have to pick a side. You don't have to pick a side. It's just kind of a joke. But I thought the fork was kind of funny of one of the, uh, the people at the march. And there's my daughter with her cat hat. I'm trying to instill in her all the things that I I'm talking about walking the talk. Thank you. <laughs> I'm usually much faster, but I'm kind of slow today. So sorry it took an hour. <laughs> Any questions or discussions? Yes. Um, and so I'm curious to, from your perspective, how to talk through that, like the fact that you need to help someone be an adult to get that allowance, or, or how that just affects the whole system in terms of um, people will be kind of bubbled up and so, um, you know, just yes. back. I think we're staying the course. Um, we've always had a very balanced uh, way of looking at things. It's not one-sided. We Equity is for everyone, and we truly believe that, and it's that minimizing barriers to maximize potential for success. And that's not gendered, and that's not race uh, polarization, right? So we, we stick to the, that core, and we hope that people come in for the conversation. We create that safe space to be able to have that conversation, because we want people to be heard. And we can't say that we hear everyone if we believe only a certain way. We can be mad of certain values not living up to our standards, and we can speak out loudly for what we believe those standards to be, but we can't exclude anybody from the conversation. Yes. Yes, that was me, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We're very thankful for that participation. And that's and for architecture, it isn't for colleges, it's for architecture schools, yes. And there's been a lot of uh, discussion on Twitter and social media of people that think that this has nothing to do with architecture, right? But again, I, I think I was trying to highlight in the, in the presentation that it has everything to do with architecture because architecture is for people, right? Architecture is social. I think sometimes we forget that because we're so fascinated by the forms we create. Uh, we forget about the people occupying them and whether or not they find them meaningful and functional and inspiring, but we have to kind of reroute ourselves in, yes, architecture is for people. And if we have that idea, then at the, at the design table, 
uh, people ask, well, how, what's the difference? What is equitable design, right? Well, equitable design is getting more voices at the table, and we have technology to help us do that. People could say, well, that takes too much time or too much money, but we can use SurveyMonkey. We use SurveyMonkey to get 10,000 voices, or, or trying to. Um, there's different software and apps that are coming out, and people are being very creative. The, the tech sector is developing a lot of these ag crowdsource aggregating opinions and design, you know, for design. So we should leverage those to get more voices at the table and say, yes, that's another a new way to do things, right? Yes. Okay, this is this is pretty funny because one was uh, speaking in front of crowds and presenting at client presentations, right? The the pitch, uh, they, I would stumble and I would get really nervous and start shaking and forget what I had to say, and they wouldn't want to take me. And at a point that the flip was, I started talking about things that I was committed and passionate about. And I also had to practice. So it wasn't just one day you get good at something, right? What Take whatever discomfort thing, skill set, thing you don't like about architecture uh, or will not like about architecture and try to turn it on its head. So people, and I noticed things that people didn't like to do and I always, ch and I didn't like to do them either, but I challenged myself to do those things because that created value. So people didn't like to do specifications. I said, well, no, I'm gonna learn specs. People didn't like to do this construction administration processes. So I learned how to do that. Not only learned how to do it, but also advance it technology-wise to say, how can we do it better? How can we do it faster so that we have less time doing the boring um, data crunching things and more, that's for you know the machine learning and the AI helps, but how can we save our precious time to have the meaningful conversations about um, how design affects people, right? And those interactions, right? So in each case, and in my new role at Smith Group, I am a principal and I'm, um, part of my role is to get work, right? So again, a lot of people are deathly afraid of going out, making the cold call, meeting strangers, um, proposing the value proposition of why you should get hired over somebody else. And that's a skill set that I was determined to learn and, and overcome you know, over time. So there's a bunch of things that if you find if you have your laundry list, think of it as a bucket list of discomfort, and one by one find people that feel uncomfortable with you, and then challenge each other and try to kind of pick those things off the list. Does that help? Okay. <laughs> and I watched a lot of YouTube videos about public speaking. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Um, yes and no. So they come out of the woodwork, which is great. They, some of them actually come back very successfully and re-engage with architecture. So they amplify um, their message by um, showing other people it can be done. So um, an example of that is Jamie Anderson, who worked for the National Gallery. She uh, was an architect, but then she ended up doing exhibit design for the National Gallery. And then certain things happened in her career she got caught onto our movement, and then she went back into architecture as a specialist for uh, cultural projects for Smith Group, you know, because it was in DC and that worked out. And, la and this past year, she got promoted to principal. So that is one of the amazing comeback stories that I like to tell. I do like to tell those stories, but there's not as many of those because, again, they're, a lot of them are already kind of in their, in their career path or whatever, wherever they are it's harder for them to jump back in. There have been a couple that have tried to jump back in with uh, different degrees of success and we still try to encourage them to keep trying. They really want to get back in. There's this woman who um, graduated and had four kids and uh, was like halfway through her exams, then uh, dropped out of architecture entirely for 20 years, then came back, took all her exams, passed them all, learned, um, Revit, learned AutoCAD, worked, did like 99% of her hours for IDP, and then somehow dropped off the face of the earth. So I'm still trying to find her and say, 
you just have to finish that 2% of hours and you're gonna be a licensed architect, right? But life happens, so we try to be the cheerleaders for those people as well, but it is harder after a certain point. <laughs> yes. That's right. That's great. It helps. Yeah. Yes. And it's not just the numbers, I think. Um, we all tend to fall and get fixated on the numbers, but it's actually the the classes that we have, uh, the awareness of the issues, like th having the coursework, the curriculum that has implicit bias discussions, negotiation, right? Um, being able to provide uh, faculty, tenure faculty, faculty positions to more uh, diverse people, right? Whether it's race, ethnicity, et cetera, uh, that represent the thoughts of different people versus just uh, skin deep, right? So, but very, very admirable that, yes. <laughs> They're actually starting um, a, a specific survey for architecture school, yes. Yeah, so we're excited about that development as well. And they came up with, um, you know how there's cards against humanity? They came up with cards for equity, so. I think that's coming out and it's, yeah, they were advertising it that they had published the beta form, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>